The Upper Room presents So You Want to Stay Married. Today's episode in this study of family life in the modern home is For Richer, For Poorer, For Better, For Worse. Especially written and produced for The Upper Room by Carlton E. Morse. Featuring Jeanette Nolan as Laura and John McIntyre as Fred. With Jane Morgan and Ken Christie. There is none so happy as two people closely tied together by a common goal ahead and with a rich background of shared sacrifices, struggles, and memories. I'm thinking at the moment of Laura Montgomery, who married Fred Evans against her father's best judgment. Yes, that was 20 years ago. I was 19 when I went to my father and said I was going to marry Fred. Yes, I've known Fred since he was born, my dear. Fred's a good boy. I think so, Dad. But Fred hasn't got a cent to his name. But hardly any young men in their 20s have money. It doesn't seem to me Fred's tried very hard to accumulate anything. I've seen little sign of industry in that young man. Oh, but you will. You mean after you've married him? Of course. No girl ever reformed any young man by marrying him, Laura. That is a dreadful romantic fallacy which has got more girls into trouble. But that's not it at all. I wouldn't be reforming him. It's just that he'll have an incentive. But will he go right on living with his family? Only drag you into the mess, too. Well, that's horrible. Of course not. Well, my dear, you go talk to your mother. And that's what I did that day 20 years ago. I went and talked to my mother. And it's just not going to make any difference, Mother. I'm in love with Fred, and he's in love with me. Well, then, there's not very much use for me to say anything, is there? Well, do you think I'm wrong? If you're going to marry Fred Evans willy-nilly, then don't you think it would be tactless of me to say anything damaging against my future son-in-law? Then you do feel the way Father does. No, Laura. Every woman must follow the dictates of her heart. The father may be more practical financially, but every woman knows that her happiness depends not on how much money her husband gives her, but how much he gives of himself. If you see in Fred all the good things you desire in a husband... Then marry him, love him, cling to him. I don't know any other way for a woman to get the thing she needs most out of life. And so, 20 years ago last June, Laura Montgomery and Fred Evans walked down the aisle of our community church and gave our lives to one another. Fred had built our service station with his father's money and we had rented a five-room cottage just around the corner. We didn't go anywhere on our honeymoon because we were too eager to get started on our career. Besides, we didn't have the money. So Fred got into his overalls and went around the corner to the service station. And I did what was necessary in the cottage and tried to keep myself beautiful and exciting for Fred's coming at lunchtime and dinner. This lasted for a month. Then one evening, Fred seemed depressed all through dinner. Another piece of pie? No, thanks. More coffee? I don't think so. Darling, there's something dreadfully wrong. What's the matter? Is it me? As though you could ask. Well, it's something. Uh, I don't know what to do about the service station. Do about it? Laura, I've just simply taken on a two-man's job, and I can't swing it. You mean the service station can't be run by one man? Well, actually, the station should be open from 6 in the morning until 9 at night. We open at 7 and close at 7. But those 12 hours are too much. Look how tired you are now. Why, three more hours would kill you. I couldn't do it. You think we've made a mistake? I don't know. Well, could I be of any help? My wife pump gasoline and wipe off windshields? Well, what's wrong with pumping gas and wiping windshields? I should say not. But I want to. I'd love it. You wouldn't love it after you were grease and grime up to your elbows. I wouldn't love being out there with you all day instead of just seeing you at breakfast and lunch and dinner. But... What'll people say? Well, what would they say if I let the station go bust just because I wouldn't help my husband out of a tight place? May I wear coveralls and a painter's cap to keep the grease out of my hair? You'll hate it. I love it. And I did love it. Without either one of us quite knowing why or how, a tiny strand that was not there before began to weave itself about our two hearts. It was made up of a shared experience. A mutual striving for achievement. The result of pitting our energies against misfortune. And that was the beginning of actually knowing that my father was wrong. 
and my mother was right about my marriage. Well, at the first year and a half of our married life, Fred and I had paid something on the principal and interest against the service station, had all our current bills paid, and had $400 in the bank. More than that, we were looking forward to the arrival of... Well, Fred insisted it would be baby Laura. I knew in my heart it was Fred Jr. We had decided it was time I stopped working in the station, and on that evening we were driving over to my folks' house when suddenly out of a side street shot a cut-down roadster. Laura! Laura, are you hurt? Laura, speak to me. Get her to the hospital. Get her to the hospital. Hurry! Hurry! Yes, we lost the baby. And I spent four long, wearisome months in the hospital. Weary, bitter, endless months. Because not only had a careless boy in a miserable car killed our child, but he had wrecked our whole financial structure. The $400 melted like snow on the stove, and bills piled up, and Fred had to do without an extra man at the station. There just wasn't money to pay him. There were four or five months when we were two pretty sick and discouraged people. And we ended up the second year of our married life not one bit better than when we were married. In fact, with $200 in doctor bills more than when we started. But do you know, that was another big turning point in our married life. The day I came home from the hospital, Fred carried me in and laid me on the bed. And suddenly he began to cry. And I started to cry. And together we lay there, too full for words. Then we were praying together and finding comfort in each other. And out of it all, we got rid of something that had been building up in us since the accident. And when we were finished, there was a new shining silver cord about our hearts that had never been there before. It was a cord of tenderness and sweetness, forged out of common grief. There was something that we had shared together that no other person or persons would ever have a share in. A marital tie that surmounted romantic love or wealth or social position or anything else my father wanted for me and was afraid I would miss with Fred. And then, at the end of our third year, our first son was born. And at the beginning of our fifth year, our second son was born. And then, in the seventh year, came the twins. One girl and one boy, and I was a very busy mother and wife. The five-room cottage fairly bulged at the seams with four children. And it was quite necessary that I make all the children's clothes as well as my own. For at the end of eight years, what with the children and the hospital bills and extra food and clothing and the absolute necessity of the mechanic to help Fred in the station, we never again had saved up anywhere as near as much as the $400 we saved the first year and a half. It was about the end of the eighth or the beginning of the ninth that we had a crisis about this very thing. It was evening and the children were abed. Sit down for a minute, Laura. Oh, I really shouldn't, Fred. There are so many things I can be doing while the children are asleep. Poor darling. Fred Evans, what are you talking about? Trying so hard to be a good wife and mother and with absolutely nothing to do it with. How can you talk like that? Your father was right, wasn't he? Fred will never make any money, and Fred never has. What's got into you? Are you tired of me? Tired of you? Am I tired of my right arm? Am I tired of listening to my heart beat? Well, then what is wrong? You're such a good and gracious and wonderful girl and deserve so much from the world. And from me, you're getting so little. Oh, Fred, how little you understand me. What I do understand, I like world without end. Well, do you think you could feel that way about me if I didn't feel that way about you? And you said something else that shows how very wrong you are. You said you try so hard to be a good wife and mother and have so little to do it with. Why, a good wife isn't the one who has money to spend. She's the one who has love to spend. 
high hopes for her family, the will and understanding to live in and for her husband, the desire to be one with her husband. And money and worldly goods and easy living have nothing whatever to do with a woman being a good wife and a good mother. Why, I can teach my children to believe in God. I can teach them honesty and integrity, the meaning of good citizenship without indulging them with costly playthings, can't I? Is it better for our children to understand the meaning of humanity, to know their duties toward themselves and their fellow men, and to know truth when they hear it? Or is it more important that they have a father with pockets full of money? You wouldn't have anything different than it is? I wouldn't trade one second of my life with you for a whole lifetime with anyone else under any circumstances of luxury. I don't know why you feel like that. It's always been strange to me, but it's good. I know it's good because it makes me feel strong and capable and the man inside. I don't suppose we'll ever have much of glamour and worldly effects, my dear. You are my choice of men. You are the one I want. Such love can only lead a man to good. And now, 20 years have gone by. The two oldest boys are just finishing high school, and the twins are in their first year. Fred no longer has a helper at the service station, because with the boys' help before and after school, he gets along very well. And as he said the other day, he would like to get the station finally paid for before he gets so old he has to turn it over to the boys. And we still lived in the same little five-room house. And we're very proud of our children, our integrity in the community. And deep within us is the knowledge that with the ebb and flow of fortune, we have built a good marriage. To us, it is a thing of beauty, a thing well-made and well-cared for. And we are proud of it, and will be, until the day we die. in your home are uncertain and giving way, family worship will help to strengthen them. Worship in the church of your choice and have daily devotions in the home. The church and the home are the basic rocks upon which the moral structure of this nation is built. They should be and must be one united foundation. Ask your pastor for devotional helps or send a postcard to The Upper Room, Nashville, Tennessee. Your announcer, Russell Thorson.